Tonight we're turning to the 12th chapter of Revelation. And in chapter 11 we came to finally the seventh trumpet sounding. My belief, not everybody's certainly, but my belief is that the seventh trumpet signals the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, what Paul called the, the last trump. And between the sixth and the seventh trumpet we saw that a new era beyond that which has been considered previously in the book, seems to be introduced. The introduction of the little book that uh, we will not go over the reasons again tonight, but in chapter 10 we looked at reasons to consider that the little book is not talking about the fall of Jerusalem. It is not talking about things that would shortly come to pass. It is not talking about things confined to Israel. While it is my view that most of the book is about those subjects, there is this section in the middle, this little book, this other prophecy. John was told he must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's the last words we read in chapter 10. And then begins this section we have come into chapters 11, 12, and 13. Now, in chapter 11, we saw... We were introduced to a, a, a period of time which is called there, in verse 2 of chapter 11, it's called 42 months. In verse 3, it's mentioned again as 1,260 days. Futurists believe that this speaks of a future tribulation period. Dispensationalists of the normal sort believe there are two three-and-a-half-year periods together, making seven-year tribulation in the future. Preterists usually identify this three and a half years with some past literal period of that length. Possibly the persecution uh, conducted by Nero, which was about that length. Or the Jewish War, which is about that length. Those are different sets of calamities, but the point is uh, futurists look for a more or less literal three and a half years, or two times three and a half years in the future, Preterists usually look for three and a half years somewhere in the past uh, related to the fall of Jerusalem because they consider that the whole book is talking about the fall of Jerusalem and I have departed from my normal, my normal preterist approach at this point. Historicists, and you will not meet many of them unless you go to the Seventh-day Adventist Church probably, but at one time the view of the majority of Protestants was historicism. They believe that the three and a half years should be broken down into days, 1260, and each day should represent a year. So the historicists believe that the period under question is 1260 years. And they consider it to be largely applicable to the age of the papacy and the beast whose blasphemies continue for that many days or years, in their thinking, is the papacy, and therefore they believe that the whole career of the Roman Catholic Bishop of Rome would be from about 600 when the papacy begins, according to most historians, till about 1860, when they thought it would fall. Well, now you know why there aren't so many historicists as there used to be. Because 1860 came and went a long time ago, 150 years ago, and the papacy is still with us. So the historicist view has kind of run out of steam, as it were, on this matter. It's the idealists that actually see this period the way I do. The idealist view holds that the number, uh, the time designation uh, of three and a half years, whether it is used uh, the days, whether it's 1260 days, whether it's the 42 months, or whether it's that strange expression that Revelation borrows from Daniel chapter 12, time, times, and half a time that all of these are talking about essentially a period that, if literal, would be three and a half years, but the, the idealist does not think it's literal, but symbolic. That the period represents something rather than, rather than estimates or gives a literal time period. The real time in question is not anything like three and a half years. 
maybe in principle, depending on what the three and a half years is considered to call to mind. Uh, I have suggested it calls to mind the ministry of Jesus. And therefore, it is a symbolic designation that suggests the completion of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was cut off in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel. He started his ministry at the beginning of the 70th week. He was cut off in the midst of the week. There's another week unaccounted for. And it's possible that Revelation is hinting that that other half week is really not literal at all, but it's the whole completion of the unfinished mystery of Jesus, and that completion is done through his body, the church. Which would suggest that the 42 months, or, or 1,260 days, is the same length as the age of the church. Not exactly the same length, because we have evidence that it begins at 70 AD. The church began in 30 AD, so it's the age of the church minus the first 40 years of church history. So from 70 AD till the end of the age, until Jesus comes back, would be represented by this period. And as you know, the reason I gave for that, the primary reason, the main indicator, although there are other lesser indicators, but the, certainly the strongest, is that we are told in chapter 11, verse 2, that the Gentiles would trample on the holy city of Jerusalem for 42 months. And Jesus said, that the Gentiles will trample on the Holy City of Jerusalem until the times of the Gentiles are over. And so Jesus, of course, in Luke 21, 23, when he says that, um, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, followed by the treading down of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. Jesus makes that length of time until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And while that is a notorious difference, notoriously difficult phrase to uh, to dogmatically identify, since it's only found once in Scripture. It sounds to me, at least, like he's talking about the rest of the church age. The rest of the time that God is bringing the Gentiles in. He's given the, the Jews 1,400 years under the Old Covenant to get it right. 1,500 almost. And they didn't get it right. And so now he's giving the Gentiles their chance. And, and Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles are over and Jesus comes back. Testing that theory, we saw that the two witnesses, if they are viewed as the church, they witness for that same period of time, 1260 days. And at the end of their testimony, although they experience a brief defeat at the hands of the beast, Yet they finally are vindicated and caught up into heaven as the church will be at the end of the church age. So while we would not necessarily say that the matter is established beyond question, we at least have a workable theory, a plausible suggestion that the 1260 days stands for the period from the destruction of Jerusalem till the second coming of Christ. Now, we saw the seventh trumpet sound at the end of chapter 11, and thus the end of the world, if that is, in fact, as I'm thinking, the, the second coming of Christ. But in chapter 12, we go back to an earlier period again, and Revelation does this. There are overlapping uh, visions that overlap each other chronologically, that run parallel to each other in time, and give us different aspects of the same period of time. Perhaps it is the failure to see this that causes dispensationalists to believe there will be a seven-year tribulation, which is never mentioned in Scripture, but by thinking that the three and a half years that we will read of now in chapters 12 and 13 is a different three and a half years than that which we found in chapter 11. Anyway, it is my understanding that all the references to the three and a half years are references to the same period of time symbolically depicted, and that every vision that has to do with that period gives us a different nuance, a different angle of what is going on, what God is doing, and what is happening during that time, and what the devil is doing during that period. In chapter 12, we will see that period mentioned twice, although the two times it's mentioned are parallel to each other rather than sequential. In Revelation 12, verse 6, we'll see that the woman 
fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. We will see that this chapter has a parenthesis in the middle and then picks up the story at that same spot again down in verse 14 where it says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to, to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, which is again the same period of time, from the presence of the serpent. We will find that verse 6 brings us to the flight of the woman into the wilderness and tells us how long she will be there, but then it breaks off for this parenthesis at verse 7 and following, and it talks about things going on in the heavenly realm. It tells us of the dragon being cast out of heaven. And then, once it tells us of his being cast out, it picks up the story of the woman again, repeating the same information that we had in verse 6, only in verse 14, and then resuming from there. So we have in this chapter a woman who flees into the wilderness, and, she, and we have the story from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter, broken in the middle by a, a parenthetical section that tells us about something going on in the heavens. So let's look at this chapter. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems, which are crowns, on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Who is the woman? Well. Let's start with an easier question. Who is her child? Her child is not hard to identify because we are told about him in verse 5, he is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is a expected to be a recognizable statement from Psalm chapter 2, which all Christians believe is a messianic psalm in which Jesus even speaks. Uh, in Psalm 2, Verse 7, the Messiah is believed to be speaking here. All Christians at least believe this. And the Messiah says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, that is Yahweh, the father of Jesus, said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now I just want to say that this statement, you are my son, today I have begotten you, is quoted in the New Testament and interpreted for us by none less than the Apostle Paul. In... Uh, Acts chapter 13, when Paul is preaching at Pisidian Antioch, he quotes this verse. In verse, I think it's verse 33, he quotes it. And he said that as that Jesus rose from the dead, it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. In other words, Paul interprets this as being a prophecy of the resurrection of Christ, not the birth of Christ. The word begotten might throw us off, but the book of Revelation in chapter 1 referred to Jesus as the first begotten from the dead. This resurrection is referred to as being begotten from the dead. We see that in Revelation 1.5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So the resurrection of Christ is seen as, as a birth. Likewise in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 18, it says of Jesus, Colossians 1.18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Christ is the firstborn from the dead, meaning the first resurrected into the new creation, into the family of God, as a glorified son. In Hebrews, it says that God, in bringing many sons to glory, 
made the first of them perfect through suffering. But God's program is to bring many sons to glory. Jesus the first to be glorified, we afterward. He's the firstborn of this new creation, of this glorified new covenant creation. And so when the psalm says that God says to Jesus, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, Paul, who sees theology the way I was just suggesting, sees Jesus as the firstborn from the dead and says, that's speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. And then it says in verse 8 of Psalm 2, God, still speaking to Christ, says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Christ will inherit all things. Christ will inherit the earth and the nations. And God says to Jesus in verse 9, You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, it says in the Hebrew, you will break them with a rod of iron. However, in the Greek, in the Septuagint, it says you will rule them with a rod of iron. And the New Testament writers usually quoted from the Greek Old Testament rather than the Hebrew when they could. And so, Revelation 12, 5 says this child was to rule all nations with a rod of iron following the Septuagint in Psalm 2.9, uh, a privilege given to Christ. Now, it is true that in one of the letters to the seven churches, he told those that would overcome that they would join with him in his rule and that like him and with him, they would rule all nations with a rod of iron. We see that in Revelation 2, where he's speaking to the church of Thyatira. Revelation 2, 26 and 27, Jesus says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, as the potter's vessels shall be broken to pieces, as I also have received from my Father. Now he quotes Psalm 2 about how he is given the privilege of ruling all nations with a rod of iron. He says that whoever overcomes will rule with me. But it's clear that if they do, it's only as sharing in his rule. He is the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And even if we share in his rule in the resurrection, we don't become the king of kings and lord of lords. He will always be that. We may be kings, but he'll still be the king of the kings. And so this child who is born in Revelation 12 is Jesus. Now the futurist sometimes believes otherwise than that. They say that this is a reference to maybe a male child represents the Jewish remnant, maybe the 144,000, maybe the tribulation saints are represented as the male child. This is much too complicated, making much too complicated what is a, a very simple statement that is, would be recognized by the readers as a reference to Christ uh, rather than some more esoteric meaning like that. Jesus is the child born here, and we have thus returned to the beginning of the church age with this chapter. Now, the child not only is to rule all nations, but he's caught up to God and to his throne. That is, of course, what we know to have happened with Jesus. After his resurrection, he was ascended to the throne and sat down at the right hand of God. The, the whole birth and resurrection of Jesus are slapped together here without any real reference to his life. It passes from his birth to his ascension without detail except that he is destined to rule all nations. It doesn't tell about his ministry, doesn't tell about his death or his resurrection, just his ascension. Now, that's not because other things are not important, but they're not important to this vision. This vision has other interests. The focus here is not to be on the life of Christ, but on the outcome of his ascension, his rule. So we now can say one of the characters is identified. Now, what about the dragon? He's another character not hard to identify because we're told precisely who he is in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. All right. That's not ambiguous. He's three different identifications. He's called the devil. He's called Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word. In the Old Testament, it's difficult to know whether Satan is even used as a proper name. You find in the Old Testament a few references to Satan in our English version, but the Hebrew word satanus means... Um, adversary. So in the Hebrew, 
where we find the name Satan, it can be translated the Satan or the adversary. Uh, the Old Testament is not clearly using it as a proper name. But the reason we see it as a proper name is because when it comes over into the New Testament, which is written in Greek, the Hebrew word Satan or Satanus is still used. In other words, it is not translated for us into the Greek as adversary. It is carried over in its Hebrew form as if it's a proper name. And so we recognize Satan as a proper name for this particular adversary. In the Old Testament, an adversary or the adversary is a translation of the word Satan and uh, and some Bibles don't even use the word Satan in the Old Testament because of that. They translate it. But in the Greek, there is a word that is essentially equivalent, and it's diabolos, or devil. Now, in this place, it said he's called the devil and Satan, therefore giving a Greek title to him and his Hebrew name. And he's also said to be that serpent of old. It's here in Revelation, for the first time that we learned that that Satan, that Satan was that serpent in the Garden of Eden. Interesting, we take it for granted when we read uh, Genesis 3 that that serpent is Satan. We almost think that it calls him that, but it doesn't. Satan is not mentioned. The devil is not mentioned in Genesis. Not mentioned in Genesis 3. There's only a serpent. He's treated as if he's just one of the animals, but as the story is told. As you go through the rest of the Old Testament, the serpent is never identified for us as Satan. Although there are references to Leviathan, that twisted serpent that will be defeated and so forth, but it doesn't tell us that that's Satan until we get all the way to Revelation 12, almost to the end of the Bible. We finally are told straight up, that old serpent, that's Satan. And so we have two of the three characters positively identified. There's a woman who we have not yet identified, there's a child of the woman, and there's the dragon. The child is Christ. The dragon is Satan, who is the woman then. Now, since Jesus is the one born of the woman, it sounds like the woman might be Mary. That's how the Roman Catholics take it. In fact, in the traditional Catholic art, it's not uncommon. And, and, and if you go to Mexico, you'll see many statues like this of Mary standing on the sun. I'm sorry, standing on the moon, clothed with the sun and with 12 stars around her head. Because this vision of this woman is taken by the Roman Catholic Church to be Mary. And reasonably enough, it seems, since she was the mother of Jesus. And this woman gives birth to Jesus. But it's not that simple. Because later, we find the same woman fleeing into the wilderness and being nourished there for a, a period of time. A period of time that I've identified as long, longer than you know, 2,000 years, or about that time. And even if I'm wrong about the number, there are statements out here that do not seem to apply to Mary. For example, at the end of the chapter, in verse 17, it says, The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I was not born of Mary, and I have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm one of these offspring of this woman. I'm one of the rest of her offspring. But I didn't come out of Mary's womb. And the Roman Catholics would say, well, Mary's the mother of us all. That's why they called her the Blessed Mother. She's the mother of all Christians. She's not the physical mother of all Christians. If we're going to make this woman having children that aren't her physical children, then there's no reason to make her actual child, in the, her first child, to be her physical child either. In other words, if these children are not her literal, natural children, then there's no reason to apply that connection to the first child either. The woman, I believe, is not an individual woman, but she is identified by the things that are said about her. She is clothed with the sun, verse 1 says, and she's in the moon, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. This imagery should not be hard to uh, identify because it is identical to the imagery in Genesis chapter 37 where Joseph is sharing one of his two dreams with his brothers, dreams that position him as, a, as having the destiny of ruling over his brothers. And uh, his, you know, he's, he shares these dreams innocently enough, no doubt, but they don't see it as innocent. They see him as trying to elevate himself above them 
And it's not very tactful of him actually to relate these dreams. They're probably dreams he should have kept to himself. On the other hand, if he had kept them to himself, we wouldn't know about them, so it's just as well. And in Genesis 37, it says in verse 9, Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Then, so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? Now, Jacob had no trouble recognizing the sun and the moon as representing Joseph's parents and the eleven stars as his eleven brothers. Perhaps because it was so similar to his previous dream, where the eleven brothers were represented as uh, sheaves that bowed down to Joseph's sheep. But the point here is, the imagery in Genesis 37 is clearly borrowed into Revelation chapter 12 to give us the identity of the woman. The sun, the moon, the eleven stars uh, would be Jacob's, uh, we, we could say Jacob's family. Jacob, his wife, his uh, 12 children, of course he had more than one wife, but that's not, doesn't have to enter into our consideration. The idea is it's Jacob's family. Joseph would be the 12th star, of course. The, the 11 stars bowed down to Joseph. He would be the 12th star. There were 12 stars in this woman's crown. She is Israel. But she's not just Israel as a whole, because not all are Israel who are of Israel. She is the remnant of Israel. Because she is the part of Israel that's preserved when she flees into the wilderness. You might remember that what John has already depicted is the, the 144,000 who would be spared from this Holocaust. They, they are escaped. And how did they escape? Well, we know. They fled into the wilderness. The church in Jerusalem, the Jewish remnant there, before it fell, escaped across the Jordan River into the wilderness area where they landed or stayed in a place called Pella. And they were nurtured by God. That is to say, he kept them alive. I don't mean to say they received supernatural uh, food like the, like the children of Israel in the wilderness in the form of manna. But here, the woman will flee from the dragon. Remember the dragon in uh, Psalms and in uh, Ezekiel is an image for Egypt. In this place, of course, Satan is the new Egypt. The church escapes from Satan as Israel escaped from Egypt. We've seen that Christ accomplished a second exodus, and it was a deliverance from Satan and his power. But Satan here, represented as a dragon, is the same imagery which the Old Testament sometimes uses for Egypt. The woman fleeing into the wilderness is like Israel fleeing into the wilderness from Pharaoh in the Exodus. And being nourished by God in the wilderness is very much parallel to Israel's experience of manna being provided by God to her. This imagery is intended to recall the Exodus. But it's a different Exodus. It is the Jewish remnant who brings the Messiah into the world. It is the Jewish remnant who flees and escapes the wrath of the dragon. And it is the Jewish remnant, not the nation as a whole, that is preserved by God. So we have, for example, over in Jeremiah, chapter 4, one of what might be several Old Testament passages that convey the idea of Israel being like a woman pregnant to give birth. Sometimes she's given birth to the Messiah, sometimes she's given birth to the new Jerusalem, but nonetheless, Jerusalem, or Israel, is, uh, is a mother giving birth. In Jeremiah 4.31, God says, For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. The daughter of Zion is Jerusalem, in this case the spiritual Jerusalem, is depicted as a woman in labor. What would that labor be? Well, it is the labor that brought forth the Messiah and the Messianic kingdom. It is the sufferings endured by the faithful Jews in the period before Jesus was born. They're like in labor. In Isaiah and Jeremiah both, 
there are frequent references to the sufferings of the Jews under the Babylonians and the Assyrians likened to men holding their loins like a woman in giving birth. It's a, it's a very common expression in the prophets because the sufferings that the Jews were going through was like labor pains. And here, the Jewish remnant, who are God's true people, not the whole nation, but the people who are faithful to God prior to the birth of Christ, go through these horrendous labor pains to give birth to the Messiah. Now, the dragon is anticipating this. He knows what's coming, and he wants to kill the Messiah at the point of his birth. This, we can see, is having some fulfillment in Herod, certainly a very demonic character, if you know about Herod the Great, how that he sought to destroy Jesus at his birth and uh, killed a whole bunch of babies in Bethlehem trying to get at him. Failing that, Satan made other attempts on Jesus' life throughout his life. People took up stones to stone him, but Jesus walked through their midst and escaped because it was not yet his time. When it was his time, he was surrendered to his enemies. And Jesus said to them when they came to arrest him in the garden, this is your hour and the power of darkness. That is, Jesus was now going to succumb to the attacks of the enemy against him because it was going to fulfill a purpose. But we see the dragon depicted as posturing himself from the very beginning against the Messiah. In fact, it may be that the sufferings coming on the woman are seen as the devil's way of trying to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world. The persecution that came on the Jews in the Old Testament era, especially in that shortly before the Roman conquests, in the Maccabean Wars, and so forth. These, uh, the, the uh, various times when people tried to essentially stomp out the faithful remnant. So, the woman then, I take to be the faithful remnant that brings the Messiah into the world. Yes, Mary was part of that remnant, but she was not the whole woman, not the whole woman here. There are things that happen to this woman subsequent to the birth that wouldn't apply to an individual woman, but to the remnant. So the woman gives birth. Oh, I should say this about the dragon. He has, in verse 3, uh, he's read, he's got seven heads and ten horns. If you bear that in mind, you'll see those same traits in the beast in the next chapter. It also says of the dragon in verse 4 that he drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now you might say, well, that's easy. That's, that's when a third of the angels fell with uh, Lucifer. Well, the tradition that a third of the angels fell uh, with, with Satan is just that, a tradition. There's actually no reference in Scripture to a third of the angels falling. And just so you know what the scripture does and does not say in that, the scripture does say there are angels who sin. In Jude, verse 6, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about angels who sin or who left their first estate and are said to be in chains under darkness or in Tartars awaiting the judgment of the great day. It does not say how many or what percentage of the angels sin. It just tells us there are indeed angels who sin. There's no place in the Bible that mentions a third of the angels doing anything, sinning or doing anything else. There's no reference to a third of the angels in the Bible. However, the idea that a third of the angels sin comes from this verse. This is the only verse. The entire doctrine, which almost all Christians presume to be true, namely that a third of the angels fell when Satan fell, is based on this one obscure verse, that the dragon's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now, sometimes stars in the book of Revelation are angels. There's no question about that. Because, for example, in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, I saw a star fallen from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit. And then in verse 11 of chapter 9, it says, They, they have as the king over them the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon and Apollyon. It sounds like this angel is that star that fell. So a star here represents an angel. Also the seven angels, or the seven stars in the hand of Christ are the seven angels to the seven churches. But that doesn't mean the word star always must mean angels. And in this case, there's reason to doubt it. And that the reason is simply this. The casting of stars to the earth is an image that is here borrowed from Daniel 
chapter 8 and verse 10. In chapter 8 of Daniel, uh, it doesn't take uh, any particular commitment to any school of thought to see that this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. I believe that a dispensationalist would see it as such, an amillennialist would see it as such. It doesn't really matter what your viewpoint is. You're going to recognize in chapter 8 of Daniel, in verse 10, the career of Antiochus Epiphanes. 